Good evening and thank you for joining us for our Wednesday evening service. Tonight we'll be starting a new study, but before we do, let me just encourage you with one thing. We are going to try, as of right now, Governor Kemp came out and said that starting on April 27th, there'll be some new guidelines and that the shelter in place will end at the end of the month so that churches are welcome to meet again as long as they practice good social distancing. So that's what our goal will be on Sunday morning, May 3rd. We will plan on having a service here at 11 a.m. Now, we won't have Sunday school, we won't have choir, we won't have nursery, much like we did back in March. This will allow so that if you would like to come, you can, but no one feels obligated that they have to be here. So I encourage you, if you can be here May 3rd, to make your plans to do so. Please understand, I know that everything could change. They could open everything up on the 27th and close it all back down by the 30th. So please, I, I know that things could change and we will let you know if they do. If you come, we would ask family units to sit together and others to kind of spread out so that we can keep some distance there. If you would like to wear a mask, you're certainly welcome to do so with that. And we won't be taking up any kind of an offering as far as passing a plate goes. We won't have a handshaking time. We'll ask everyone not to shake hands just to try and protect everything that we can, as the governor has asked. But just wanted to make you aware of that. So be praying about that, that the Lord would continue to keep that door open so that we can meet. Now, you may say, I'm still not sure. You are welcome. The service will be done virtually as well. So you are welcome to stay home, have a part in the live streaming. If you have little ones and you bring them and you go, oh, I don't know, they may misbehave in the service, we will all understand and it will be okay that Sunday. It may be that you say, you know what, I want to come and just to be able to see folks, but I know that with my little ones, we have the little twins, that you may have to stay in another room and watch it virtually in another room here in the building, but at least you'll get to interact some with folks when you're here. Whatever the case may be, whatever the Lord leads you to do, certainly you are welcome to do that and encouraged to do exactly what the Holy Spirit has for you. But just be praying that we are able to meet on May 3rd that morning. That evening and Wednesday evening, we will continue to do virtually for right now. Uh, but as of this moment, we will plan on meeting on Sunday, May 3rd, and so be in prayer about that. Last week, we finished up our study in the book of Haggai. If you have your Bible, join me in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, we are going to begin a new study on how God uses ordinary people. And we're going to start specifically with one group of ordinary people that were greatly used. That group is named for us here in Matthew chapter 10. Verse 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples. So that's what we're going to be looking at, is the ordinary men that were the twelve disciples. Beginning in verse 2 now, now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So that's kind of our first four. Verse 3, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican. So that's kind of the next group of four there. And then James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, also known as Thaddeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot. So that will be kind of the group that we will be going with. Uh, when we look at Simon the Canaanite, often he is referred to as Simon the Zealot, and so we may refer to him in that name as well. But that gives you the names, and a couple of them have other names, surnames. We will be going by when we refer now to the 12 disciples. As we look at them, we see in these men ordinary men who were greatly used of God. And what that does is it challenges us to ask a simple question. What does it take to be used by the Lord? Sometimes when we look in Scripture, we see these individuals that were used. And we look at them and we're just kind of blown away at how God used them. And we, we make them very big. We go, oh, I could never be used like that. I don't have what they had. And we make assumptions. I am too ordinary. I am too plain. These men were great. But when it comes to the disciples, that was not necessarily the case and who they were. In fact, after Jesus has gone in Acts chapter 4, the religious leaders come and they notice a couple of the disciples. And they look at them and here's the description given to us in Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. 
that phrase there, unlearned and ignorant men, it is literally translated illiterate ignoramuses. They, they looked at them and they thought, these guys, how can these guys have any boldness to talk about God? How can these guys have any boldness in declaring the, the Old Testament? How can these men have any idea what they're talking about? They're ignorant. They haven't been educated. They don't know. We can't have any respect for these men. And we look at them and we revere them. We hold them in high esteem because of what they did accomplish. But here was the difference. You had a group of religious leaders that were very well educated, who were very knowledgeable about the things of God. But here was a group of men who had been with Jesus. And the difference in the two. So we look at it, we ask the question, what does it take to be used by the Lord? The presence of the Lord makes the difference far more than the education does. Now, I believe in the day and age in which we live, there is all type of opportunities for us to grow in our knowledge of the Lord. And we should use that, and we'll be looking at it more in just a moment. But in that day, they equated their study of God's Word with knowing God. And too often that happens still today. The difference was not, and what makes us used by God is not some innate ability in which we were born. But what makes us different is if we have been with Jesus. So these men, they had been with Jesus, and they go from these ordinary, ignorant, unlearned men to greatly used of God, so much so that those that were religious leaders looked at them and said, how do they do this? What gives them this ability? So when we look at it for ourselves, we have to ask the question, what do you want to accomplish for the Lord? When the disciples started, Jesus went and found them and called them. It was not as if they set out looking for Christ. But in calling them, and pulling them in and saying, look, travel with me, learn with me, grow with me, let me help you. In doing that, as he begins to teach them, they begin to grow, they begin to learn, and they begin to accomplish great things. But they accomplished great things because they set out and said, what are we going to do for the Lord? And more than that, they answered an even better question. What do you think the Lord wants you to accomplish? And instead of what do I want to accomplish for the Lord? Boy, I have some things I want to accomplish for the Lord. And I have to be careful that what I want becomes subservient to what he wants. And that I make the decision, what does the Lord want me to accomplish? And because the Lord could take ordinary men and take them and accomplish such great things with them, it's important for me to remember, I don't need anything extraordinary about me. Boy, I'm grateful for that. But what I need is to have been with Jesus in such a way that now I'm accomplishing what he wants for me to accomplish. When we look at these 12 men, one of the keys in looking and understanding them is that they were just ordinary men. In the weeks ahead, we will look at some of the amazing things in each one of them, some of their character traits and how they grew in them some of the things that they learned, and some of the things that they were used to do in Scripture and in areas in which we don't have record in Scripture. Just history tells us. But before we get there tonight, I want to take just a few minutes and look at these men and unfortunately look at them in every area in which they didn't do so well, in every area in which they were just ordinary. They were just like you and I. The first thing we see about these men is that in their walk with the Lord, they lacked spiritual understanding. They lacked spiritual understanding. In 1 Corinthians 2, 5, it says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Here were men who had good worldly wisdom. They understood their trades well. Matthew, I'm sure, was a good publican. When it came to fishing, Peter, James, and John, they were able to make a living and provide for their families through fishing. When we look at each one of these men, there were men who were committed. There were men who were seen as traitors. And yet they all come together, and they come together in the Lord. Their worldly wisdom was there, but their spiritual understanding, they didn't have the religious background. But yet they had to grow. 
And even in their time in walking with the Lord, and even in the times in which Jesus taught them for years, there still was a lack of understanding. Jesus said to them, you're slow to hear and slow to understand. He took three and a half years to train them, teach them, and yet even there near the end of his life, when the time was coming to a close, they didn't understand that he was going to die. They weren't there at the resurrection. Here were men who in their life, though they began to follow the Lord, even in their time with him, their spiritual understanding was slow. Often the Lord had to teach them. He had to pull them aside and say, don't you understand these things? Let me explain it to you. No, 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 we don't do that. Children, bring them to me. Don't keep them away because in them, that's the kingdom of heaven. Over and over, the Lord had to teach them and over and over, the Lord has to teach me. Our spiritual understanding can be so weak. Sometimes you, you hear someone preach or, or you see somebody on the internet and you watch a YouTube video and you hear them expound some truth from the Bible. And you go, oh man, their spiritual understanding is so much better than mine. God couldn't possibly use me like he does him. But the truth is, the spiritual understanding that I lacked, the disciples lacked. And they had to grow into it. They had to grow into it so much so that even after his resurrection, when the Lord is sitting and talking to Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? And Peter says, I love you like a brother. He says, no, but do you love me unconditionally? If you do, go feed my sheep. Go teach them. Go train them. Your understanding needs to grow so you can then in turn pass that on. Their spiritual understanding, much like ours, was lacking. Not only did they lack spiritual understanding, they lacked humility. They argued between themselves in Matthew 20, verse 20 through 28, Mark 9, and in Luke 9. Who will be the greatest among us? Who gets to sit on thy right hand? Who gets to sit on your left hand? Lord, when you come into your kingdom, who's going to be the most important? The Lord said, look, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, you've got to learn to be a servant. They didn't want to be servants. They wanted to be powerful. So much so, even there in the garden, after the Lord speaks and all of the men fall down dead, Peter pulls out a sword and tries to win his own battle. It's easy to try and fight battles in our own might because in doing so, we think we're great and we begin to bit strong and we feel like we have the ability and we lack humility. At the last meal he would share with his disciples, the Lord goes in and he says, you've got to learn this, so let me wash your feet to teach you this. Peter, no, 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 Lord, Lord, you don't need to do that. She says, oh, Peter, you've got to let me do this you got to let me do it so we can have fellowship. You need to learn this lesson. Now, I believe all of these men did. I believe they learned this lesson in a great way. And I think in so many areas later in their life, we see it. But early on, they really genuinely lacked a humility. And I look at myself, and I know you could say the same thing. As Americans, by birthright, we have an innate pride. We are proud of our country. We are proud of our freedoms. We are proud of our form of government. We are proud of our churches. And yet, so often, it is our pride that is in the way of God working. And we need a far greater humility. We need a far greater humility in our lives. We need a far greater humility in our worship. We need a far greater humility in coming before God and saying, Lord, I humbly seek your glory. These men lacked humility. And when we lack humility, we are no different than they are. And we can grow just like they grew. Not only did they lack humility and spiritual understanding, they lacked faith. Four different times Jesus says of them in Matthew 6, 30, 8, 26, 14, 31, and 16, 8. Oh, ye of little faith. Guys, y'all just don't have any faith. Our faith grows as we see the Lord working. Our faith in anything. If you have an automobile that you have driven for some time and it's been a dependable car, boy, you have faith in that car. You have faith in your job, if you've been working there for any amount of time, that it'll be there when you come back. You have faith in all type of things that you see and you build trust in. The disciples 
had been with the Lord for years. They had seen miracle after miracle after miracle. They had seen people who were sick. They had seen them healed. They had even seen as the Lord gave them power to do such things. Back in our passage here in chapter 10, verse 1. And when he called him, his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Guys, if y'all will have faith, not only will you see me do great things, but you can do great things. All you need is the faith the size of a mustard seed, and you can tell this mountain to move, and it'll move. And yet here they are, following the Lord, seeing everything. And the Lord says, hey, we need to give them food. Lord, 200 penny worth isn't enough. How are we going to get food to feed so many? Their faith was so repeatedly small. And our faith is so repeatedly small. We have all of the accounts of God's miraculous working. And what we do is we look at his, the way God worked in the Bible and we go, yeah, but he doesn't work that way today. And we take the greatness of God and we minimize it. And then we go, but I don't understand why God isn't doing great things anymore. It's because we have no faith. We need to have faith that God can accomplish as he always has. We should have more faith than disciples because we've read the account. We have that more sure word of prophecy. But not only did we see what the Lord did with them, we have seen what he has done in the years since. We have seen how people have come to persecute the church and the church has survived. We have seen how people have come to try and destroy the Bible and the Bible lives on. And we've looked over and over throughout years at how God has answered prayers. And we have accounts and we have testimonies. And we... We should have greater faith, and yet often ours is weak. And the encouraging part of that is so was theirs, and God greatly used them. Jesus performed miracles in front of them to build their faith. He rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart in Mark 16, and yet they still, at the last moment, did not believe he would raise from the dead. Their lack of faith shows that God can use ordinary people. Not only did they lack faith, they lacked commitment. There in Mark 14, verse 50, when Christ is taken away in the garden, the Bible tells us that they all fled. They all left. They all forsook him. They all walked away. Jesus prayed to his father there in John 17 that he would give them strength, and they still run. They all lacked the commitment to follow, but not just then. Afterwards, after they had seen him in the upper room, after he had appeared to them, after they had seen the power of the resurrection, they still went back to fishing. Isn't it amazing how much our commitment wanes when we are walking with the Lord and we think we're there, we think we're strong, and a situation comes and we get weak. We have seen individuals who were faithfully following the Lord in their life and then completely turned away from the Lord. And we look at that and go, yeah, they had no commitment. But how many times have I started something for the Lord that I believe he'd laid on my heart to do, and before I got done with it, I gave up on it? Our commitment to what God is doing is essential. And yet so often we lack it. And when we lack that commitment, the great thing is we're just like the disciples. Now, As they grew, as the Holy Spirit begins to grow inside of them, they go to a place in which now their commitment is to death. But it wasn't always that strong. We can grow in our commitment to the Lord. They lacked faith. They lacked commitment. They lacked power. They lacked the power to cast out demons and stand up for Christ. Jesus sends them the Holy Spirit to help. And yet, here they are, going about their life, in a time in which they saw Christ, they walked with him, they were there ministering with him, in which they had no real spiritual power. One of the great concerns that I have for our generation is that as churches, we just lack power. We don't see God doing great things because we don't have the power of God. It's why this year we are memorizing our verses that say, look, how much more will he give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? We can have the power of God on our lives. We can see God do great things. We can see him work. He is capable. He is able and he's desirous. But we, oh, how we need the power of God. God's power is not short. It's not lacking. It is infinite. But what's the difference? 
when the disciples wanted their own power, their own might, their own names, their own pride, they didn't have it. When they had been with Jesus and they were changed, now they had power. Paul said, look, I would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. God uses ordinary and he puts his power there. And then that ordinary becomes extraordinary. So when we look at these men, we see these were simple men. These were not men who were of any type of a profound, amazing ability. They were ordinary. They're ordinary. So why did God choose this group? Why didn't God choose Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a man who came to Christ, who had the credentials, who had the academic background, who had the understanding of all of the Old Testament law, who had even some influence. Joseph of Arimathea, same boat. There would have been other religious leaders that Jesus could have used, but he didn't. He took the ordinary. So why? Why did he choose this group? Well, I think there are several reasons. One, it's the same reason he chooses you and I. It's the same reason he chooses us. It's because there aren't any perfect people to work with. And when you take those that are mighty in this world, they tend to get the glory. When it came to the starting of the church, Jesus knew God needed all the glory. And so ordinary people with his power can accomplish far more than incredibly talented people without his power. Paul. Paul would have fallen into this category. Paul would have been someone that from the religious leader's point of view had all of the giftedness. He had all of the strengths, all of the abilities, all of the knowledge, all of the reasoning. His education was there, but his heart wasn't. And then God changes that. And then God does use him to accomplish those things. But here was a man who had great ability, but he learned. His great ability without the power of God was nothing. But his ability with the power of God was far greater. And he believed that God even then made him weaker so that he could be greater. And we have to recognize that when we have inabilities and when we have ordinariness about us, that's when God gets all the glory and he does so much. So God used the disciples just like he uses you and I. His strength is made perfect in weakness. When there is those of us who lack, then God comes in and says, I will fulfill because I'm the one who will get the glory. Oh, the greatness of God in seeing his strength. Now, the truth is, no person ever has the ability to do what God can do. No person ever has the ability, but they think they do. And people can see it. But when we humble ourselves before God, then God uses us as ordinary people to do extraordinary things. If we will desire to keep growing, God can keep using us. Let it not be that as a Christian, you come to a place to where you feel like you have arrived, to where you have gained all that you need to know. Instead, continue to search, continue to learn, continue to grow, and then continue to pour out. If you take in, you take in, you take in, but you never pour out, you become stagnant. When we get back together as a group, it should be such a joy for us, not just that we can be ministered to together in a different setting, but now we can minister to others again, that we can have that opportunity in a real way to minister. We should always count it a blessing and a privilege to get to serve the Lord. And when we say, God, I want to do more, I want to grow more, I want you to get more honor, more glory from my life. If we humble ourselves to him, he will bless us greatly in his service. Make no mistake, being used by God is the great privilege of any person. And to for a second think that I should serve the Lord out of duty, that, that it's a requirement of me, is a fleshly choice. But to recognize I have a privilege, a joy, an opportunity, and a blessing to get to serve the Lord. When we come before God, we serve him with a joy that comes knowing that as I humbly seek him, he can greatly use me for his honor and glory. And one of the things I believe you find is as you read biographies and as we study even these men, they never know they're being greatly used. They just see God doing great things. 
it's when we look back on them historically that we see their greatness. But truly, it's not theirs. It's God's greatness in them. I look forward to studying out these ordinary men who God does extraordinary things with. As we finish up, let us be sure to pray uh, that God would allow the coronavirus is COVID-19 to pass so that we can begin meeting together. And I would ask that you would uh, begin to pray that we could start there on Sunday the 3rd. I, I would love to get back together and be able to be here together as a church family again that morning, Sunday, May 3rd. Pray for Tanya. She has her last treatment on Friday. I know that there are others who have been out there. Uh, Donna Hildreth has asked us to pray for Corey. He is a man who's had the COVID-19 and has struggled severely, but has turned the corner and is recovering, but it's still weeks uh, that he will be in the hospital. Mr. Gloden, uh, who is a family relation there to Pastor Jeff, he is struggling as well, but doing better and turned the corner. And so continue to pray for them. Um, Mrs. Logan's brother-in-law passed away, so pray for her. Uh, that family, Bob Rosenthal's family, and for Mrs. Logan, for also uh, the Hambies, as I know they appreciate it. They sent a beautiful thank you card to us, uh, appreciating everybody's prayers. So continue to pray in each of these situations. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we lift these up to you, Lord, specifically asking that you would help use us as ordinary people and not allow us to let the things that are ordinary in our life move us from serving you, but encourage us that you get the glory. Father, may it be that you do great things through us so that you receive the honor. Help us to come back together here in May. Lord, I know so much is going on. I pray that you would take the virus away. Protect as now there seems to be more movement going around. Give wisdom to all of us, to our governor, to our president. Lord, I do pray for those who have lost loved ones during this time as it is a very difficult time because of even the limits to be able to have funeral services, encourage them. Uh, I think of Miss Warwick and for Miss Logan. And Lord, I pray that you would also help Miss Betty, Mr. Benny, uh, with their health conditions for Corey, Mr. Gloden. Lord, that you would work in each one of these physical needs. And Father, spiritually, get a hold of our hearts. Lord, may we seek to be close to you and may you get great glory from our lives. We ask these things that you may receive all the praise and honor, and it is because of Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for joining this evening. Lord bless you.